Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the third session of a three session series on groundwork, food, land, and climate. Now, first, a few housekeeping items. Uh, we need to be aware that of respecting each other. Uh, keep your microphone off, keep yourself on mute. And unless you need to um, ask questions, use the chat. Uh, if you need to applaud, there are, in, during the workshop, there are um, little tools in the participants um, or in the reactions button at the bottom of your screen that you can applaud or you can raise your hand and uh, put it, put it in, the, in the chat if you have a question. Um, if you want subtitles, there is a a, a button at the bottom that you can have uh, closed captions while you while you're watching. Now let's start with the land acknowledgement because this is all about the land. The land is alive. The land is alive because the soil is alive. The plants provide the oxygen because the soil is alive and it makes the planet alive. So this is a sacred living breathing, uh, sentient and suffering land that we're living on. This is also the land of our relatives, the indigenous peoples who have cared for this land for many thousands of years, cared for it sustainably, named particularly in this land, the, the Wendat people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the uh, most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, who are now the rights holders of this land by Treaty 13. Now, this is also the land governed by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty Covenant. This is a treaty that dates from hundreds of years before contact, is the basis of the, of the uh, Six Nations or Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which was then brought back to life in a treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the, Miss and the Mississaugas, or rather the, the Anishinaabek of the Great Lakes region. And it stipulates that one must take only what one needs and leave the rest of the bounty for the other human and more than human beings with whom we share this land. This is also um, an agreement to share the land peaceably without any reason it's called with one spoon because it there's no sharp words or sharp, sharp object. object. No, no. So, so that, that I will I will move to um, introducing a wonderful video by Shia Bastida. She is a 19 year old Mexican Chilean climate justice activist and a member of the indigenous Mexican Otomi Toltec Nation. Based in New York City, she's an organizer with Fridays for Future and the co-founder of Re-Earth Initiative, an international youth-led organization that focuses on highlighting the intersectionality of the climate crisis. So in this short video, she invites us to use our human imagination, potentially the most creative force on Earth, to imagine and therefore create the world that our hearts know is possible. So let's imagine with all of our senses a city that's regenerative, vibrant, clean, safe, happy, and prosperous. So let's show the video now. Anything, Anything we ever, we ever achieve, achieve started by someone imagining it first. So if we can't imagine a way out of the climate crisis, it just can't happen. We know that the crisis is getting worse every single day and many of us are losing hope for our future. But despair is not an option. We must rise up and meet the greatest challenge of our lives with stubborn optimism. And imagining is the first step. So, are you ready to imagine? In this critical decade, the biggest tree planting campaign in history is sucking billions of tons of carbon out of the air and forests and indigenous lands, they're protected. This is what your city looks like. It's green, I mean everywhere. 
Streets are pedestrian and kid-friendly. Food growing on rooftops, in car parks, which by the way, we don't need anymore because we don't own cars anymore. And here's something, birds. Can you imagine your city as a sanctuary for nature and wildlife? There are solar panels on every rooftop across the globe. Clean, interconnected energy lights every home, every clinic, every school. We no longer choke on the toxic fumes of fossil fuels. It's not hard to imagine. This technology already exists. And what about the millions of new jobs created? Are you picturing it? Really picturing it? Roads? They're green too. Traffic's cut right down. Public transport everywhere is electric, dependable, and free. Can you smell the air? Clean. Farming? All regenerative, which means healthy soil and better food. And we don't eat much meat. Can you imagine what we could do with a third of the world's cropland currently used to grow animal feed? Here's something to imagine. Fields of seaweed, miles long, grown in oceans that cross the planet. They draw down billions of tons of carbon, restore sea life, and guess what? They're a limitless source of protein-rich food. And we can do so much more. Rewild our land, protect our cities from rising sea levels, restore coral reefs. These things we're imagining, they're all possible now, just with technology that's available today. We are the last generation that can prevent catastrophic runaway climate change. We cannot give up. Anything we ever achieved started with someone imagining it first. This is the decade to make this imagined future happen. Share this video and help those around you have the courage to imagine it too. It looks like I'm going to introduce Sally. Uh, so our next speaker, the, the, uh, thinking of imagination, um, our next speaker is Sally Miller, who has so much in terms of credentials that it, it'll take me longer to, to name them all than, um, than we have time for, for her presentation. But she's provided research and writing in a range of fields from nonprofits, businesses, and co ops for the last 20 years. Projects have focused on sustainable food and farming, renewable energy, nature building, or natural building, I should say, natural food marketing, co op development, and more. Listing all the research publications, books authored, food, land, and co op consultations she's done would really take it more than the allotted time. So welcome, Sally. Thank you, David. That was a very kind introduction. Um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Let me know if anybody is having trouble seeing that. Are we good? OK, I see a thumbs up. Awesome. Um, so, uh, as the as the first speaker, um, I I actually wanted to talk uh, uh, in this sort of larger scale um, about the systemic uh, movement and momentum that's gotten us to this crisis. Um, so, and then uh, uh, you know, and then we can drill down from there. Um, so I do want to add my own land acknowledgement, um, being in Toronto. Um, on the, I'm on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Sagas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. Um, and now I'm home to many First Nations. The other thing that I like to mention during this uh, time of the pandemic and so many virtual workshops and meetings is to remember that the resources that allow us to run our computers 
and have these meetings, these wonderful meetings with each other are also uh, resources drawn from traditional territory. Um, some of it's still contested. So it's good to, to remember that we're, how we're dealing with that. So what I want to look at is, is actually a sort of the larger uh, crises. What I, what I see right now is that we are in relationship to food and farming, uh, not just a crisis in how we're doing it, but a, but a large system-wide economic crisis in relationship to food. So I'm going to name the, the problems I see and then talk about some of the solutions that I've, that I've worked with amazing people on. Um, so absolutely, first and foremost is uh, the, the crisis of farmland, which you all probably know about. And that just comes down to uh, losing thousands of, of acres of farmland every year um, to other uses. And this is actually from the Holland Marsh um, where there is actually still some diversity of farming, um, integrated pest management, some interesting innovation going on. Um, and a uh, very important part of, of farming for feeding the city. Um, then what happens with this is that these things begin to overtake it. And uh, none of these things are contributing to solving climate crisis. Um, so we're seeing uh, farmland sold to urban sprawl, um, people having to depend on their cars to get from one place to another. We're actually seeing farmland being lost. Um, if you look at the 407 and the fights around that, farmland being lost to um, these massive roads that you're getting so you can't even see across them anymore. And then quarries. Um, we know about the fight with the mega quarry um, north of Toronto. The problem with a lot of these uses um, is that they are not driven by protecting the land. They're, they're driven by short-term profit. And the land is actually very hard to regenerate when they've been used for these things. Um, despite what people say, it's very hard to remediate the land after it has been taken out of farmland. Uh, part of the reason for that is, is uh, uh, the complicated fact that, that uh, when in my in my book belongings i interviewed a lot of farmers um, in southwest ontario and i realized that one of the things that makes farming work is being able to work with other farmers so being in a community of farmers so when you start seeing it breaking up as as starting to happen up the 400 where you have some significant important farmland um, being broken up by strips of development what happens is that um, the the farm input providers, the large animal vets, um, the, the um, people who could help young farmers get started, the whole infrastructure there starts to disintegrate. And this is a systematic breakdown, um, which really damages our ability to grow food. Um, on top of that, this is bad math in a way, if you're looking at economic development, um, any of these uses that I've covered up the Holland Marsh with in this slide, these are not as valuable to a municipality as farming and manufacturing. Um, both of them actually bring economic multipliers, which are higher than these, these things. Um, sprawl actually costs a municipality money having to put in new infrastructure. Um, so this is our problem. And I always, I bring this back. I know I'm talking to people who do live in the city. Um, part of the problem is that we are allowing farmland to go to the highest bidder. And before we blame the farmers about that, we need to remember that those of us in urban environments um, speculate on our houses. Um, many of us will talk about the value of the house. We look at it as our pension. And we have to ask ourselves, if we're allowed to do that, why aren't the farmers allowed to do it? What would make the farmers not look at their land as their pension and want to sell it to the highest bidder? So we, we all need to rethink our relationship to land. And then on top of that, some of the, what I think was coming up when we were talking about regenerative agriculture. So um, there is so much innovation going on in agriculture. It's so exciting. And at the same time, you're seeing some of the same old practices. So you're drive around Ontario, you're seeing uh, winter land that's not covered. Um, so the 
So you see the winter winds just blowing the soil off and we're losing our soil wealth um, pound by pound. Uh, you're seeing erosion, um, again, just the heartbreaking loss of one of our most valuable resources. Uh, another thing that we that we have allowed to happen is is a lack of um, by what I'm calling financial literacy. People always talk about the price of food, but it's actually a lack of financial literacy and the cost of food and health. Um, and people always pick on Starbucks coffee, so I'm picking on ice cream instead. But we, as consumers, we and I'm not free of this. We we uh, we have things that we know the price of, and we and we examine the price of it, and we get upset if it goes up. And there's things that we just buy, like ice cream, perhaps without thinking about it so much and not comparing it to healthier food. Um, so this is prices that I found on online. Um, the price of the salad on the left, because I grew it, is actually even lower than $1.69, but that would be the price if you bought it. So the other thing that we know is going on is that uh, I want you to consider the carrot. Um, carrots are, are often very important, especially in, in kids' lunches and things like that. Um, and this is where there is some mythology around our food system, which is damaging the climate. Um, I think we, it's easy to imagine that the carrot is grown in Holland Marsh, which is true. There are a lot of carrots grown in Holland Marsh, that it gets into a truck. Um, and then working your way down to the right hand side of my slide there, it ends up on a retail shelf or even in your CSA box, and then it gets uh, on your plate. Um, in fact, the majority of carrots travel more like this. 20% of carrots um, in the greater Golden Horseshoe area that, that, that we're eating in Toronto, 20% of them are exported. So the Holland Marsh is producing enormous number of carrots, 20% of carrots that come from us are exported. At the same time, 25% of the carrots that we eat are imported, which means that they are going and coming. And if that, and this is called redundant trade, um, obviously multiplying people off and say, well, my food has gone 3000 miles, it's gone from California to here. It's actually probably gone more than that. Um, it's probably moved to a central warehouse, it's moved to another warehouse. Um, it's, it's a well-traveled carrot, unless you're buying from the CSA. And to give you an example of this, one of the uh, one of the farmers in Southwest Ontario that I interviewed talked about what had happened during the fires in California. Um, there is one facility in California that that makes baby carrots. And for those of you who don't know, um, baby carrots are not baby carrots. They are adult carrots that are carved into baby carrots. And there's one facility that does this in California. So because of the fires, the carrot yield was not as high in California. And our own farmers in Southwest Ontario were exporting their carrots to California to be shaped into baby carrots and to be sent back to us. And uh, this close up just shows you that those carrots are, they've really had quite a life already. So that's the sad part. Let's think about solutions. Um, there are so many different ways of doing farmland protection. I'm giving you examples. This is Black River Co-op. Um, he's leaning on his, on his bee boxes there. So he's saving pollinators. He put up solar panels. He did a greenhouse there in Northern Ontario. Um, so we wanted to expand the season. They are a co-op and every member of the co-op is a food business and a land-based food business. Um, so their, and their purpose, they've had to move to a new piece of land, but their purpose is to have a piece of property owned by the Black River Co-op um, with land-based businesses protecting and stewarding the land and keeping it in a land trust in perpetuity. So it's a beautiful solution. And it's Northern Ontario where agriculture is expanding quickly. So here's another one. Um, and this is very important. This is why co-ops are so important. And I was asked to bring up co-op examples, but the reason they are so important is because we have allowed the food system to get out of our hands. Um, we need, so we need to restore the food system 
not just with regenerative agriculture, but regenerative agriculture owned by the producers, owned by the communities. So Turnisol uh, Cooperative Farm is in Quebec. They've had uh, inspirational uh, effect on the developing farm co-ops in Ontario. They are a worker co-op um, benefiting from some of the advantages and foresight sightedness of the Quebec government to be able to start earlier. Um, and they direct sales, CSA, they're beautiful. Um, example. Shorten supply chains. So no more of these tangled carrot um, uh, things, no more uh, sculpted carrots, but, but what we need are more, this is eat local grapers. So we need more of the, and this is a co-op, it's producer and consumer owned. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea because this brings the producers and the consumers together at the table to solve the systemic problems that I talked about at the beginning. Um, so they're shortening supply chains, they're buying direct from farmers, um, selling only regionally. And I just, I'd like to see this kind of food hub across Canada. Um, and then uh, supporting climate resilient food and agriculture. And I know, I think that you've talked about this um, already, but, um, this is, a, this is a recent organic farm that Fair Finance Fund invested in, and she works with horses. So she's producing some of the inputs on the farm. Um, we were able to invest in her first uh, uh, long-term lease, and we're just uh, so delighted to see her work. And it's a great example, actually, because she's, um, because she is, uh, shorter um, than a lot of people using horses. She had to get a special kind of horse, she calls them ponies, um, so that they would be the right size for her to be able to work from. Um, the name of that farm is Vintage Soil. This is Hoppy Fields Farm. This is in Southwest Ontario. And this is one of the solutions that I wanted to bring to you as the manager of the Fair Finance Fund to say one of the things that we are doing is providing capital for the solutions that we need. And after about 10 years of doing research and helping to develop co-ops and doing consultation with co-op members at the local food and farm co-op network, we were, people just kept, we'd say, what do, you, what do you need? And people kept saying, we just need the capital to do the work we want to do. And the reason this is important is because we are actually in a transformation of our agricultural system. There are more and more people like Thomas here, Hoppy Fields Farm, doing direct sales, doing regenerative agriculture. And this is not something that conventional capital recognizes. Um, so it's very hard for them to get capital support. Um, so this is what we do. We provide affordable loans up to 200,000 for farm and um, food social enterprises across Ontario. We offer hands-on assistance from soil health to marketing. Um, we, uh, I actually believe that, um, and I keep saying this to people, we, we track our impacts. We, we want to know that our loan clients have social and environmental impact, but we believe that that's reducing the list, risk of the loans that we get. So knowing that a farm is climate resilient means to me that they're more likely to thrive as we go forward. So it's just the right thing to do. I'd rather invest in them. Um, but we, we do, you know, find with conventional financial institutions that if they're organic, if they're regenerative, it's still not well understood. Um, for us, it's a way of protecting um, the capital. And so far, we've it's been uh, it's been great. So this is our results so far. We've just raised uh, over a million. Uh, we're very proud. We just passed that mark. Um, every penny of the capital we raise goes to clients. Um, we don't use any of it for operations. We've given uh, 16 loans and across the food system, across the province. And all of them are like rooted oak here near Ottawa, this uh, farm owned by these two wonderful people that we just invested in there. They just got access to their forever farm and we're in, invested them in them, uh, rerouting some of the wet part of their one of their um, fields into a uh, pond that they could use for irrigation. And, and they're just, they're doing amazing uh, farming and I hope they will be doing it for a very long time. Um, 
we build resilient local economies. So we're investing um, in our goals are local food production, locally owned, going to regional markets. And in that way, we're trying to transform the food system, be part of transforming the food system. And looking at the entire food system. So we're not just investing in agriculture because we have good regenerative farmers that need markets. So we invest across the entire food system. Mm -hmm. Sally, and, we're actually over time, so. I know, that was my last one. Oh, very good. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it's it, what you're saying reminds me of conventional e economics the, in the words of, of uh, Oscar Wilde is the economists know the price of everything, but the value of nothing. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And uh, I think uh, by offering us alternative economic systems and the way you've presented that the deeply set um, um, e economics of convention of conventional agriculture, I think you've really shown us a way through. So thank you so much. Now I'll turn to uh, Michelle Delaney, who has uh, done some brilliant work as a resident of Thorncliff Park, a densely populated multicultural high rise community located in the northern part of East York. It's a popular landing community for immigrants and with a population of around 30,000. It's known to be a low income area and it has its struggles and issues such as gang activity. However, we'll see how farming is making a difference beyond food. Michelle is co-founder of a resident-led group called Thorncliffe Park Urban Farmers, collectively called TPUF, who've been working towards addressing food security in Thorncliffe Park for eight years. Starting way back in 2012 with another new mother, Michelle met who she met in the community, both of whom were looking to expand in their green lifestyles and growing organic food. So with help from the neighborhood office, they created a communal garden, which expanded to two quarter acre garden lots and 25 fruit trees, all of which are located between eight different high rise and low rise property. So I'm eager to see the brand new video that they put together for us tonight. Welcome, Michelle. having some tech issues. Michelle has put together an amazing nine minute video that I, I had the pleasure of watching the first edition of, and it's very inspiring as soon as it comes on. I don't know who's playing the video, but it's not me. There we go. One of the reasons why we decided to start this project is being residents of Thorncliffe Park ourselves, we noticed that there was a lot of food injustice in the community. These spaces used to be farmland. The soil nutrition depletes and the quality of the soil depletes. Thorncliffe Park is a community of approximately 30,000 people. It's really known for being a landing community for new immigrants. Oh, he's here. We are here. All, I came with him uh, 26 years ago. So my name is Michelle Delaney and I'm a co-founder of Thorncliffe Park Urban Farmers, which is a resident-led community group and our mandate is to tackle food security issues in Thorncliffe Park. My name is Zara Ahmed, I'm in grade 10 and I work here for a summer job. 
we are at a safe place. This is um, the 71 Garden. Um, this is a very important piece of the community. Many people come here, adults, elders, children, toddlers, they all come here to help out. They all come here to talk. My name is Mohammed Amin. We are here at 53 Thorncliffe Park Drive, Toronto, Ontario. This is the back side of the building. It's a community garden here. We noticed that the local stores were not selling locally grown food. There was no option to buy even organic food at the time. And we thought, you know, like we're a big community here and that like we have to leave our community to go get these things. And we live in a world-class city, like it, it's mind blowing. Our neighbors are getting corn that's grown right here in our backyard, rather than somewhere even from up north. When you live low income and you have four or five children at home, the last thing you're going to do is spend five dollars maybe for your own personal health uh, because your kids probably need cereal more than you need kale. So here they're able to take home some kale uh, for no, no cost and they're able to empower their own well-being. Kalalu, the form of vegetable. Like spinach. Spinach. And I love I love the kalalu because my iron is low yes, good for iron. and so it's good for iron. When we designed this particular space, we took it we took everything down to the ground, we tilled the whole entire land, yeah. and then we set up what is going to be our walkways and then we set up what's going to be our areas for planting. I think without having the support of a not-for-profit behind me, I'm not sure how far I would have gotten. So as just a resident, I definitely experienced some struggle, um, but I was graciously supported by the neighborhood office. We had them out here for a whole week and they just helped us set up the garden, they helped us build the shed, they helped us build the fence. And from having support from other bigger organizations, that's really what gave us success. Runs up one side of the garden and one that runs up the other side of the garden. We learn how to garden, how to grow food organically. We learn how to pest manage organically so we're not in, uh, continuously adding pesticides and having runoff go into our valleys and our water systems. Um, and it's quite possible to grow food organically very successfully. We do make a big impact because we're growing a ton of food every year that we give out to the community. And that's a ton of food that's not being imported through a truck. In the gardens, we grow everything from a variety of herbs, tomatoes, potatoes, garlic, carrot, turnip, kohlrabi, cabbage, corn. We grow things that are culturally appropriate for um, our ethnic communities, such as Kalu, for our Caribbean people. We have some amaranth, which is laksha, for our South Asian people. And if there's nobody, still we can bring our kids at here. And it's good, we can eat different, especially our country food also. Yeah. So we are all very crazy for that. Things are difficult for them to find in the grocery store and they're also expensive for them. So here they're able to, to grow it. It also tastes way better if they could find it in the grocery store. And they're able to bring it home for their families. So our gardens impact a lot of people, but I would say on average, we probably give harvest shares to at least 50 families every season. Thorncliffe Park is one of the communities of Toronto that has the highest number of children in one community. And so when we teach our children to grow food, we're helping the next generation as well because these are skills that are dying out. So it has a spreading out effect. Um, I love how everybody can just come and just, you know, grab different types of vegetables. And I love how, like, a lot of people just, you know, come here and we can all just work together and how it's always a fun place. I think there's a really important food security part of it in, in helping our community have access to fresh food. Um, 
and just being involved in that whole process. The average farmer here in Canada is over the age of 60 and they're concerned about who's going to fill this gap, right? So, you know, when we start to teach our children that growing food is is a skill and it's a skill that they, they can achieve and you develop that love of growing food into them, then hopefully, you know, we're going to inspire the next generations of growers and we can close this this generation gap, this, this farmer gap that we're experiencing here in Canada. So this year Thorncliffe Park Urban Farmers has expanded into creating a pollinator garden um, and through that process I really started to realize just how many invasive species are in our green spaces and especially in the Don Valley. So our pollinators also need proper habitats as well. So helping to restore and create uh, spaces for them also in turn just helps us and also helps the global climate crisis. We find sometimes actually we could have a whole bunch of cucumber flowers and nothing starting to bud. Right. And the reason being is because we're lacking pollinators, we're lacking bees in our, in our garden spaces. They suffer a loss of habitat all the time from uh, development and you know again from invasive species just continuing to take over the green spaces. So everything is a circle with each other and everything has a relationship with each other. So we're either having good relationships or we're having bad relationships. So I envision raised beds beside bus stops where people can get off the bus and harvest some herbs or take a pepper or some kale and they can take that home with them. I envision more pollinator gardens and having spaces where we can educate about native plants, we can educate about invasive species, and doing more internships in the garden spaces. I think about providing opportunity for at-risk youth, uh, helping them gain skills and employment opportunities within their own communities so they don't have to necessarily leave. I think about when our trees will mature and how much food that we will have being produced from our from our spaces and the impact that all of this is really going to have on our community in the near future. Thank you, Michelle, for this brilliant, inspirational um, vision that you presented. I think uh, when I think of the possible alienation that people experience in these high-rise uh, developments, especially some places where there's a lot of uh, new immigrants and they don't necessarily know their way around all the tricks of the trade of living in the city, this is um, absolutely brilliant, and I think. It's something, an uh, inspiration for everybody. So now I'm going to introduce Sunday Harrison. Uh, so Green Thumbs Growing Kids works with a cluster of elementary schools to grow food forests in their school grounds. Their educators are teaching positive solutions to the climate crisis based on soil biology and composting and promoting biodiverse ecosystem response and design for kids linked to the school curriculum that's integrated. They're using culturally relevant food plants, annuals and perennials, including fruiting and native shrubs and trees grown from seed. Programs include youth employment and farm trips. So this is co continuing on from what uh, Sally and Michelle have been presenting and I'm really um, excited to hear Sunday. So welcome. Hi, thanks so much. I'm excited to be here and loving the presentation so far. Um, yeah, where our work uh, focuses on schools. So uh, Michelle, that was a, a brilliant setup as well for, uh, for our work. I'll just share my, um, my slides if I can see how, okay, that would be there, that would be there. Okay. So, I mean, we're in the a kind of a umbrella of urban agriculture, um, and it's it's supplemental. It's but I think incredibly important for learning because many of us urbanites have no idea where food comes from. 
So we're starting from the perspective that public land should be utilized for public education and food literacy. Um, my presentation is about our school gardens, but also dips into some soil science that is true anywhere that there is soil, urban to rural. Um, Green Thumbs is my organization, and our mission is to cultivate environmental stewardship through hands-on garden and food education for urban children and their communities. We partner with uh, the TDSB in a cluster of low-income schools, elementary schools, focused on garden-based learning, and we've been at it since 99. So garden-based learning is important for us all to make the connection between healthy soil and healthy food um, and teaching respect for the land. So the food that's grown is used in classroom cooking programs, lunch programs, and goes into the community in summer, um, donations, markets, et cetera, helping with healthy food access. Our programs include field trips to farms, um, and we aim to inspire young people to grow wherever they are and to promote farming as a career with school gardens as a starting point. Um, and indigenous land recognition, uh, you know, is, is so critical right now, and our programs are increasingly indigenous led um, to honor that the land we are grateful to share. So uh, just take you on a little tour of our school gardens. This is the largest one and has been uh, in operation since 2001. I think it's like the largest elementary school food garden in our board and also one of the longest running. And that's because of us as a community partner. That's my opinion. Um, and there's Sunday, a great- Did you have slides? Because we can't see them. Oh. I don't know why you can't see them because I said share my screen, so I'm not sure. What are you doing? Why not? But thank you. Um, display settings, spot presenter view, and slideshow. How about that? Oh crap! No Sunday. Sorry, no one is. Nothing is coming up. Screen to share. Yeah. Oh, oh so see. sorry. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm glad you said something because I was just blah, 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 blah. Um, but um, yeah, I'm just going to click through because I've already said these things. You get to see the pictures now. So sorry about that. Yeah, so this is where we were, was at Winchester School Garden, which is in, um, it's kind of south of St. Jamestown. You can see the, the uh, high rise buildings there. Um, it's at 11,000 square feet. It's probably the largest elementary school food garden in the board. And there's a hot lunch program, a very exemplary um, nutrition program that accepts all the produce and turns it into healthy lunches. Um, the next garden we started to cultivate was just up the street at Rose Avenue, which is in St. Jamestown. It's a high rise community, one of the most densely populated neighborhoods in North America. And uh, we have a kind of a corner of the land there. Um, but the kids are so totally engaged and it's a lot of fun. And thirdly, we started a garden nearby, a Regent Park School um, in 2008. And it's very, um, it's like, as you can see, it's a front yard garden, so you can't miss it. And um, it was actually started by Lead to Peace, which is a youth group organizing against gun violence. And it's very, very nice, um, good soil and um, very, very productive land. And finally, we're starting a couple years ago, we started cultivating a green roof uh, in Regent Park. It's a shallow soil, an extensive green roof. It's like five inches of soil and growing mostly greens and herbs. 
And we're looking to try to make that a small social enterprise because it's not, there's no public access. As you can see, there's no fence. So we, it's staff only. So our objectives are better nutrition and food literacy for students in our programs, uh, connection to the origin of food for the students and families, a chance to grow their cultural favorites, as Michelle's video is outlining, over 70% of our community are newcomers, skills building for youth and options for income, local food production and composting for soil health and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to learn about climate change. Exposure to the natural world and green space with varying trophic levels and biodiversity and tree nurseries growing trees from seed. So the, some of the things we're teaching is as David was saying, um, soil is a living organism. So to support it, we are composting, which reduces our food waste in the community and also supports the soil biology. Uh, we're not using any chemical fertilizers or herbicides. Um, what we teach is that what we're doing to the soil, we're doing to ourselves. Our bodies have this complex unseen world within, just like soil. And when we're killing off microbiology in the soil, we're also hurting our own bodies. We teach about trees. Trees are the most successful plants on the planet in the sense that they grow the tallest and live the longest. What's their preferred soil? High in fungal organisms. What do fungal organisms do? They lay down carbon, storing it the longest. Yeah, this is uh, soil biological succession. So this is your, most of your croplands are heavy on bacteria and low on fungi. So as you move into the upper succession layers, deciduous trees and coniferous trees, you're looking at a huge reversal of the fungal bacteria ratio in favor of fungi. And they are the ones that are sequestering our carbon. So, this, this little bit of the science is really fun because learning about photosynthesis, plants are taking the CO2 out of the atmosphere and they're photosynthesizing. They're breaking it down to carbon and oxygen. They're exhaling the oxygen. Thank you very much. That's what we like to breathe. The carbon is made liquid essentially and up to 60% of it is actually exuded into the root zone to feed the soil organisms. And this is fairly new um, research. Like our curriculum doesn't even, the school curriculum kind of treats soil as like a medium that holds the roots. But imagine that the plant is actually giving more than half of the, of the photosynthate to the soil organisms. So we're talking, this is the original giving economy, right? It's not a leaky faucet. It's, they're doing it on purpose. And the soil organisms are, causing the, the nutrients in the soil to be bioavailable to the plant. So it's regenerative um, and because we're not disturbing the soil layers any more than necessary to plant. So similar to no-till farming, we always keep plant roots in the ground so that they're always exuding, even weeds, as long as they're not toxic. Um, since they are part of the web and we don't use chemicals. Using chemical fertilizers tells the microbes that they're not needed and they will die off. So our food programs um, are fairly labor intensive, but they're shown to have more potential than feeding programs alone in supporting food literacy. So gardens are a critical piece of um, food literacy overall. And school gardens are shown to increase consumption of fruits and vegetables and encourage children to try new foods. They're also access to nearby nature for city kids. It doesn't have to be all about food, although food is fairly compelling and fast growing relative to other types of plants. So they can really see the results of their work. Trees, shrubs and perennials create interest and habitat. A food forest is our goal. 
And uh, of course, even with so many proven benefits of school gardens, they're still not included in policy. So this will continue to require advocacy and champions. So we're teaching more about climate change in our programs, uh, solutions-based. Um, we're talking about young children. So, you know, try to keep it all solutions oriented. Um, local and urban grown food can provide about 10% of nutrition to city dwellers. That's an estimate by Rod McRae and a group of researchers in 2012. Um, and of course, as, as, as Michelle and Sally pointed out, urban gardens are producing more nutrient dense foods that haven't traveled far, which is a benefit to their taste and less greenhouse gas emissions in transporting them. Um, yeah, so we're starting to use microscopy so that we can begin to, uh, to actually look at the fungi and bacteria mm -hmm. and get a feeling for what, what they actually look like. Um, who else is doing this? Um, we're engaged with others via Climate Change Education Canada Facebook page, Environmental Education Ontario, which is kind of going through a reboot right now to be focused more on climate change education and biodiversity, and the Environmental and, Sustainable, Environmental and Sustainability Community Advisory Committee at the this, this school board that we're partners with. Um, at the provincial level, Sustain Ontario has an edible education network, and at the national level, there's uh, coming out of BC's Farm to Cafeteria, Edible Education Community of Practice. And I just wanted to highlight um, one of the big thinkers in our, in our movement is the Erosion Technology and Concentration Group, ETC Group. Um, and the document that I've linked here um, is really all about reclaiming food by social movements and civil society, which is, I think, exactly where we're all, you know, knowing that we need to go. And just my thank yous are to NSERC, the Promo Science Program, to Eco Canada, Missouri Beak, and Canada Summer Jobs. Ontario Trillium Foundation, City of Toronto Urban Forestry, and many individuals and foundations. Thanks. Thank you, Sunday. That's, uh, wow, I, I keep getting more and more inspired. But I imagine when I was in public school, we didn't know any of this stuff. And to be able to integrate this kind of science into the curriculum, I think it just, we're getting these kids into becoming real, real amazing human beings. So. So thanks so much. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce two speakers. I think we'll do this both at the same time. I think that's the plan. Uh, first, Lily Fan. Uh, she has started with her sister, Mai. They started the Fish Tree Farm. It's a young, small, and growing regenerative farm uh, in King, I think it's just north of the city. The vision is driven by the recognition that our present social systems, institutions, structures, and values are inadequate and failing to meet the existential crisis of our time. They believe that the future of humanity will be fought through our stomachs. Fish Tree Farm is their effort to provide a measure of food security for the local community while being petri dish, there's some more science, for a new agriculture and a new, rela new relations with the earth. So uh, she says, the future of humanity will be fought through our stomachs. We can either take back control of our basic needs or yield them further to corporate control. I will also introduce Josephine Gray. Jo is the project head of the Oasis Food Hub and co-founder of the St. Jamestown Co-op and EcoJust Food Network. She has 35 years experience in human rights and, and food sovereignty or organizing. She says, we are in a geopolitical struggle for the future of food, just and sustainable real food ecosystems for the people and planet, or, or exploitative, exploitative, toxic, fake food systems for corporate profit. This is not a drill. What we do now will determine the destiny of humanity. So I will, um, I think the, the plan is for you uh, both to go on. I, I, I know you've worked it out amongst yourselves, so I will leave it to you to organize it over the next, I guess, 25 minutes have we got? 
I think that's it. Okay, welcome both of you. Thanks so much, David. Um, I'll be going first just to talk about uh, Fish Tree Farm and, and why we're um, doing what we're doing and what we're doing. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Josephine. But I just wanted to say that I am very <laughs> uh, inspired by all of the speakers so far. And it gives me great hope to know that other people are um, doing great work in this sector and especially focusing on the youth. Um, and, you know, I just I just really wish that these the the kids that Sunday is educating will grow up soon and take over the reins of the world because we really need them to. Um, so my uh, my sister and I started um, our farm fish tree farm two years ago. We're into our second season, um, and it's an endeavor uh, with my whole family. We started a farm partnership, so everybody kind of pitched in um, the capital to to start the farm operations. Um, but I'm the one that uh, is the farmer, and my sister is the main financier. Um, and basically, uh, we initially thought about farming as a way to uh, make our own family food secure, um, to give us a land base to kind of buffer us against any of the um, shocks to the system uh, due to both the climate crisis and the economic um, crisis. Um, but of course, you know, once we started and, uh, and, and thought about it further, you know, we realized that our, if our, our family can't just be the ones um, that experience food security, uh, that's not real security. Humans are social animals and therefore, you know, we need to look at the um, the resiliency and well-being of the community. And so if the community is not food secure, then in no way can our family be food secure. And so Fish Tree Farm, we're we're approaching uh, agriculture with the mindset that we want to um, eventually, you know, be a, a hub for the local community, um, not only to meet their food needs, but also to, to help knit together um, those uh, community relationships that, uh, you know, within which everybody can meet their basic needs um, and benefit from each other's uh, efforts and energies. Um, in terms of our agricultural approach, we are uh, experimenting with different uh, regenerative uh, practices. Um, I won't go into detail because it's the same like cover cropping, you know, minimal tillage, um, uh, encouraging more predatory insects and pollinators uh, and so forth. Um, I, I wish I had photos to show, <laughs> um, but uh, I was in actually in the field today and it was so hot and I was just concentrating on harvesting for tomorrow that I, I forgot all about my camera. But, uh, but if you were to look at my fields, you know, it uh, would probably give the conventional farmer um, heart palpitations because it is abundant in weeds. <laughs> um, but when I look at my field, I it makes me happy uh, because um, I see all of the insect activity that is happening around those weeds and in and on those weeds, you know, um, and I know that, you know, my field, it's not only growing food um, for my family and community, but it's also uh, feeding and um, feeding a, a great insect population, uh, not just the pests that you know we commonly think about when we think of insects but also the other insects that feed on those pests um, and the insects that uh, pollinate you know the different plants and I also know that uh, aside from the benefits you know to the insects those weeds are also benefiting the soil uh, and including um, the, the crop plants, you know, because the weeds are providing a living mulch um, that will keep the soil cooler, you know, during the hot weather uh, that we're having, minimize 
evaporation from the soil. It's helping to maintain the integrity and the structure um, of the soil, as well as, of course, you know, uh, within the roots, as was discussed, there's a great nutrient exchange taking place, you know, not only uh, between plants and um, bacteria and fungi and other soil organisms, but also between different plants themselves, uh, which can only benefit, you know, uh, the food crops that are in that field as well. And so that's, I guess, um, I guess for me, you know, farming is a, a, a big step off a cliff, uh, especially because I'm trying to do it in ways that are um, not compatible with our economic imperatives. Um, so, you know, I'm not going for crop yield, even though I would like a good crop yield. Um, and I know that if I were to till my fields, you know, I could get better yields than, than I'm currently getting. Um, but that's a short term gain. And I know that in the long run, I will be worse off, uh, even on an economic level, you know, than if I were to try to do things, um, you know, uh, the right way, or at least the regenerative way from the get go. Uh, and to my mind, I sincerely believe that regenerative farms can't really succeed um, to, to the scale that we need them to succeed if farming remains um, a, an individual enterprise or a corporate enterprise. You know, true regenerative agriculture, uh, if it is to be the, um, the basis for a new relationship, you know, between humans and nature, it needs to be a, a, a communal uh, activity. You know, the way it was in the past when people got together and helped each other, you know, and worked the land together. Um, and, and, and the proceeds, the crops, you know, uh, of that endeavor belonged to the community. There was no, um, uh, you know, there was no thought of, can you afford this food? And if you can't, too bad, you will starve. <laughs> or, you know, if we can't sell it, we'll just throw it away, dump it in the ocean, or, you know, let them rot in the field. If communities owned, operated, and controlled uh, their food production, all of those things, I believe, you know, will be moot you know, won't even be a consideration because it will be uh, food grown for people who need to eat it, right? And if that food can't be eaten right away, the community will ensure, you know, someone and uh, or group of people within that community will say, hey, look, even if we can't eat it now, let's preserve it. And they will make sure that it will be preserved and then distributed back when the time comes, right? And I think that uh, um, that we've really gotten away from that and, and, and we've lost sight of the collective nature of agriculture. And, and that is why our agriculture is so sick. Um, and I also believe that uh, even though we have the solutions in hand, um, at least the technological solutions, uh, and, and by technological solutions, I also include regenerative uh, agricultural practices like cover cropping and minimal tillage. You know, um, those are technological solutions. We know them, we, we know what we need to do. What we don't have are the social solutions that must go hand in hand with regenerative agriculture if we really want to see it succeed. Um, and, and those social, those social um, skills and, and technologies and resources, you know, are um, things like, for example, you know, how do we relate to one another? Um, how do we relate to land in a way that recognizes the intrinsic living organism that that land is, you know, and its inherent right to exist with or without it? Uh, with or without us, you know, and, and the inherent rights to its own vitality and well-being, you know, and 
I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, if we view land as a commodity to be owned and controlled and traded and bartered, um, then we can't really talk about regenerative agriculture. You know, it, it, I read the uh, articles in the CBC and the Globe and Mail that were shared um, earlier tonight uh, about regenerative agriculture. And it's great that that is coming into the mainstream discourse, but it really disturbs me um, uh, to a great extent because a lot of that discourse um, basically assumes a, uh, a very central role for corporations to drive that change. And mm -hmm. for me, that is a big red flag because corporations don't exist for the greater good. They exist to make profits. That is their bottom line. You know, they are only getting into this discourse around regenerative agriculture now because they see what is coming down the pipeline uh, with regard to climate change. And so they are trying to control the game and mm -hmm. control that, uh, uh, you know, control the solutions, you know, that we will implement as, uh, you know, as a species. And I think that we should be very, very careful about that because, you know, um, sure, Monsanto can create and is creating great organic produce, but at what cost, you know, at what cost to the human collective, uh, to human rights, to issues of justice and equity, you know, and also to the environment. Because as soon as uh, the corporations can control us, right, then they will steward the environment for their own interest and not for the interest of any other life form on this earth. Um, so <laughs> whatever, I'm sure I'm getting... Um, close to time. And so I, I, I want to talk about the Equal Just Food Network um, because uh, Fish Tree Farm is a partner with St. Jamestown Community Co-op on this initiative. Uh, and basically what we're trying to do is connect um, local urban communities, um, especially those that may be living in uh, food deserts um, or uh, that are you know food insecure to connect those communities to um, local and regional farms. And to bypass all of the middlemen, you know, so um, so to basically untangle that string <laughs> um, that uh, that food follows, you know, so that it becomes more of a straight line from local regional farmers to local communities, um, and to have more of a a, a, a personal um, working relationship between farms and communities. Um, but that's not to say that you know to foster relationships between farms and individuals. We want to foster relationships between farms and communities um, because I think that, uh, that we need to pay more attention to the social nature of human nature and human societies um, and to, again, start to um, kind of build those skills back up. Uh, and I think I'll pass it on to Josephine now, and she can talk more about uh, um, not only the Food Network, but what the St. Jamestown Community Co-op is doing, which is very exciting. Well, what's so exciting about it, it has a lot to do with Lily and Fish Tree Farms because she's turned over two acres to St. Jamestown to um, have our residents come up and be able to experiment and learn. And she's been helping to train residents on how to do agroecological farming. And I'm just gonna take you through um, a quick slideshow about what we're doing in St. Jamestown, which is a part of and um, a founding organization of the EcoJust Food Network. So I'm going to try to get this up and hopefully it will share. All right, can people see that? I'll just pull it up. Okay, is that visible to people? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So, um, you know, as Michelle was talking about Thorncliffe, it has more people, but it's also a bigger community, like land-wise. It has more land as well. The interesting thing about St. Jamestown, which is also incredibly densely populated and very, very diverse, we have about 25,000 residents within less than a normal city block, so less than a quarter square mile. We speak over 140 languages, and there's a lot of people from around the world 
it is a, another landing strip for newcomers. And we have a lot of knowledge and experience and possibilities. And we've been working for quite some time to figure out different ways to achieve food security in a community that basically has no land. So again, fish tree farms is like a, you know, a wonderful opportunity for us to actually be able to grow. We created a dem democratically controlled nonprofit enterprise so that we could start to control food security projects and other sustainable development projects in our neighborhood. We developed this Oasis Food Hub model that we're trying to get implemented. And the idea is to bring healthy and affordable food to St. Jamestown. Um, we want to try to achieve the human right to food, which includes food being culturally appropriate, unadulterated, sustainable, et cetera. So in that regard, the Food Hub tries to incorporate the goals of improving health and food security, creating sustainable jobs and social enterprise opportunities, providing community education programs and working with local universities and colleges for placements and to provide um, training ground and to reduce impact on the environment. We want to do this by having a full cycle food hub that goes for everywhere from growing and production, which right now involves working with local farmers and even helping to grow our own food, but helping other farmers as well to um, plant and harvest and be able to make that direct urban rural food connection. Um, but also then, as Lee was saying, what do we do with that food? How do we make that harvest last? You know, do we dehydrate it, freeze dry it, pickle it, preserve it? Variety of ways and skills and talents that all sorts of different people bring to that. We do bulk food buying so that, for instance, during the winter months and also for um, non-perishable dried goods and grains and stuff, we aggregate our buying power to make affordable purchases possible for a very healthy food for the community. So that, um, combination of growing, producing, and procuring. And then there are ways of which are processing it, making meals from it, making meals for those who are vulnerable or can't cook for themselves or working too hard, don't have time. And then making sure that this food waste or the, the extra resources that are left behind after a meal is made um, or finished is turned into really healthy compost. And as Sunday was saying, you know, um, compost is incredibly important in how we utilize our leftover food and put it into the soil. We don't want a lot of processed chemical food. We want healthy food in that process. So looking at ways in which we can bring the compost back to the farmers and help to regenerate the soil. And in order to do all this and within our model, we have a cooperative that you know, does a combination of things from developing membership relations, doing communications, and that includes translation. We run a time bank and that helps us to, to create this um, an alternative economic relationship between the farmer, uh, the kitchen, the consumer, you know, the, the field to the table, but a time bank helps us to monitor and value all the time that people are putting in and to create um, value and a sort of time-based currency from that. And in a low-income community, which has very little money, that's really important. Um, you know, we go uh, stuff around social enterprise, like helping people to start a little juicing business and things like that. Obviously the education and training so that people have the skills and the ability to run this food hub and to go out and do farming. Um, that's incredibly important for us to have the on-site capacity so that we have the ability and are empowered to cultivate our own food system. And of course, research and evaluation on its ongoing basis so that as we're doing this um, experimental but innovative food hub, we're constantly improving and learning from it and building it up. So, you know, this is about engaging all the cycles of the food cycle, making sure it's affordable, accessible, and appropriate making sure that it's run by and for the community so that we're not just at the mercy of external agencies and the like coming and going. And you know, maybe they run out of funding and they don't care anymore after a couple of years and they rarely hire our residents. And it must be climate and pandemic resilience. So climate resilience has been a very important part of our um, focus. We have managed to get some cooperation from the city and we're now working on a um, collaborative framework with a neighborhood food table of uh, city housing, the city agencies and resident groups. And we're trying to establish a framework for food security in the community to ensure that food is constantly seen as a human right, that there is accountability to the community, that it, you know, the food solutions that are exercised in the community 
are working towards self-sufficiency and that we understand that health equity relies on food equity. We wanna make sure that it's inclusive of all the community members. And we have an incredibly diverse neighborhood with many, many different dietary needs, everything from halal food to um, you know, indigenous folks who have more of a Northern diet, people who diets from the global South and different parts of the world or the far East. So a food systems approach in our particular community has to incorporate all these things, similar to what Michelle was talking about. We also want to make sure that our food is continually being grown in a way that's resilient and adaptive and helps St. Jamestown to be resilient and adaptive. So this food security framework aligns with many of the city's stated policies, um, policies of the federal government and the like. We're trying to bring agencies, government departments, housing and the like, into a dialogue and cooperation so that we can work together on somehow managing to feed over 25,000 people in a very crowded neighborhood. You know, we do constant surveys and we talk to our residents and we know that people have you know, a real desire for cultural foods that are difficult to access, figuring out how to grow those or procure those even from farm partners in the global south. And we've been starting to make relationships with farmers in the global south. An important element that has recently arisen through the city is the issue of black food sovereignty, which, you know, 15% of our community or double the population um, average for most of the city is people of African descent. But people of African descent are very, very diverse. And we're trying to figure out how do you make a food sovereign system? In other words, not just food security where you can rely there being enough calories because the food bank can give you cereal or something, but food sovereignty means controlling the system of food, including the livelihoods made, including the way in which we treat the ecology and the way in which we treat um, the animals and the like. So this is food sovereignty to us and we're trying to build that up. The city has agreed to try to build a food ecosystem like this and that resonates very well with all of the other kinds of regenerative, healthy, sustainable food systems we've been talking about. It adds and includes the issue of equity for those who've been traditionally excluded and marginalized. And we see a really important uh, link between Black and Indigenous food sovereignty, also knowing that many people are Black and Indigenous mixed. So we are trying to build this into our whole food hub food system. So part of our focus is in bringing black and indigenous folks up to fish tree farms, learning how to farm and the like. And we know that internationally, you know, there's this sustainable development goals that Canada is supposedly bound by in the city and everybody. And we show a lot of ways in which, you know, our particular food hub aligns with and supports these sustainable development goals. And we hope that that will encourage the government to recognize that these kinds of models and these kinds of food system innovations are indeed a way to help achieve the sustainable development goals as well as to address climate action. As part of the EcoJust Food Network, um, it grew out of something called the Emergency Food Forum, which we've had for a couple of years. We have urban rural dialogues about how we can transform our food system. And these are some demands that we've come up with through the Food Forum that we are going to be pushing and asking government and society to pay close attention and to try to you know, put the changes and investments required in order to allow for us to have, you know, an infrastructure, resources and skilled labor that can, in fact, sustain um, a just and sustainable food system that we, you know, mobilize and train people from the city and the country to work together in harvesting, processing and distributing food. That we make sure that people who are working in the food system from the field to the kitchens, to the restaurants, to the places where they prepare French fries and everything else, have decent healthy living conditions. It's ridiculous that the people who make and produce our food are often in very, very poor working conditions and struggling to be able to eat themselves. And we believe that this is an incredibly important time that requires real meaningful collaboration between civil society and civil services. We seem to have forgotten that government is supposed to work by and for us, that we pay them to work for us. So we are trying to help educate our governments to work with our organizations and communities in order to try and develop and change rules and regulations and invest in um, a truly regenerative food system that can meet climate action targets and prevent ecocide, because ultimately our future relies on this kind of cooperation. So there's some pretty pictures of our neighborhood and our people. And I just wanna say, you know, as somebody who's been involved in this series, that I think it's very important that we realize that there is a big struggle over the future of food, that right now, 
you know, going from the local to the global, even though as we see a struggle in my neighborhood in order to be able to access healthy, affordable food, the same goes for the world. And the same goes for many of the people who come to my neighborhood because of climate migration, because of um, wars and everything else. You know, we're like a microcosm of these global issues. And we therefore always pay attention to what's going on globally. And right now there is a, big struggle between the parts of the United Nations that were focused on trying to develop a healthy, sustainable food system and the World Economic Forum, which has kind of hijacked a what they call a UN food summit, which is currently, in a sense, um, an attempt for the big corporate ag corporations to take over control of global food systems, which is a really big problem. At the same time, many people within the UN systems have boycotted and are resisting this and are joining in and working alongside Via Campesina, which is a massive global movement of small farmers and fishers and people who are trying to work on the land and work with a lot of, um, involves a lot of indigenous groups and organizations and networks. The, they and many other organizations, um, both international, regional, and local are working together in a people's food summit to try to um, shift the balance of power so that we can actually move our food system towards a more sustainable future and have the kind of effect that we need to have within our food system transformation in order to slow down and eventually reverse uh, global warming. You know, we know that uh, the food system, all of it combined, is responsible for roughly 30 or more percent of greenhouse gas emissions and a lot of ecological problems, a lot of pollution, a lot of toxicity of poisoned waters. And we need to transform our food systems if we're going to be able to survive. So we are in the midst this year right now of a global struggle as well as a national struggle and a local struggle. So this series, I hope, will help to provide people with a lot of ideas and understanding and awareness and opportunities to get directly involved in actually creating and cultivating the kind of food system that we're going to need in order for our children, our descendants, and all our living relations to be able to sustain, as was declared in the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, as was you know, once uh, accomplished by the Indigenous peoples of this land of Turtle Island. We hope that this coming together of people from around the world with each other, working online and together on the land will help to actually make the change that we need in order to have a better future and a better world. Thank you. So yes, I think we were going to have a question and answer after this perhaps. I'll hand it over to you, David. Uh, I'm Lynn. Lynn Anderson with Climate Fast, one of the sponsoring organizations for tonight, and uh, be very happy to put questions to our panelists. Uh, so maybe we could have the panelists come back. Um, uh, put on your video so we can see you all. And that's great, wonderful. So now if, um, if folks would like to put your questions in the chat, we will take them from there. Um, if you already had a question farther up in the chat, maybe you want to pop it back in again, please, because um, we may have missed it. Um, so you have these wonderful speakers and we have, uh, I think probably about 10 minutes to, uh, to entertain questions, or you may have questions for each other panelists. So please um, go ahead if you if you if there's something that popped out to you uh, tonight about these connections for urban rural connections uh, and the future of food. Please um, please go ahead and, and add a point or ask a question. So maybe just indicate if you want to. I, I will say that I was so impressed to see the work being done with children. Um, that is that just fills my heart, you know, and our heart has to be in our work. It was mentioned earlier tonight just what a scary time this is when we read a report from the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change today that says we are accelerating towards an unlivable future. And that is where we're going if we do not um, 
make the changes that we need. And agriculture is not very often talked about, which is why we wanted to do this series. And uh, because it's, a, it's, it's definitely part of the solution. Um, and we need to make those changes. So um, you all are taking different angles on how those changes might be made. So let's see if we've got any questions. Um, lots of people saying that it was very inspiring. Lots of thanks for the um, presentations tonight. In the chat. It was a question to me. Um, I think the question was, can we maintain growing year round? And that's an incredibly important question. And in a winter country where we have basically one and a half, two growing seasons, um, one of the things that we're trying to figure out is how to have urban agriculture be able to grow food during the winter indoors um, in climate controlled spaces. And as I was mentioning, and you know, unlike uh, Thorncliffe Park, we have very, very little land. We have a lot of underground space and we have things like underground swimming pools and stuff like that, where we could be growing um, by aquaponics. We could be growing food, plants and fish in a cycle that could sustain the community or help to sustain or supplement the community through the winter. You know, ultimately I can see a, a, a vision where farmers can also rely on cities to help feed them, not just cities relying on farmers, but we have to do a lot of rapid um, symbionic technological development to try to do a form of urban agriculture that is not just mechanistic and corporate, but it is also based in these values of, uh, of justice and sustainability for people as well as for uh, the ecology. I'd like to make a point to um, uh, backpacking on, on Joe's um, about I guess, flows of resources between um, cities and farms, uh, because we need to close that loop as well. Uh, when farms export food off the land and into the cities or elsewhere, you know, we're taking nutrients uh, from the soil. Um, and so we need to put back those nutrients in some way. Um, my long-term dream is to have a closed 360 farm. So as many inputs um, uh, that I can uh, produce myself on my farm means that much less that I have to buy or rely on off farm. However, that is a, um, it's a pipe dream because you know no system is a completely closed system, um, and because I hope to feed the community, you know, then I know that I will be exporting a lot of nutrients from my farm, uh, and cities actually produce a lot of nutrients, both in terms of organic waste as well as in terms of human manure and um, you know and urine and all. Um, basically sewage, um, and that can be captured uh, and potentially brought back to, to the farms in the local area. And so we close that nutrient loop. And if we can find a way to do that effectively and efficiently, it can also be a, um, uh, the basis of, uh, of a future economy as well, right? That's, you know, communities, if they can harness, capture and store all of the organic and sewage waste that they produce, and then, sell that to the farms or exchange that to the farms for um, for food, you know, I think that uh, um, then we can start looking at maybe alternative economies, you know, that get away from um, the capitalist economy. There was a question in the chat for Michelle, uh, and it was the relationship with the Toronto urban growers. I didn't catch the question, I guess. I've... Sorry, it, it, it was um, your relationship with Toronto Urban Growers? Our relationship is uh, Toronto Urban Growers is a nonprofit organization that celebrates uh, local growers like, like all of us here. Um, and our relationship is that they uh, will be featuring our project at Thorncliffe Park Urban Farmers as part of their Urban Agricultural Week, which happens in September. And you can check out their website for more information, Toronto Urban Growers. Thanks. Yes, and there's a question about pollution, urban pollution getting into the food. Um, did you want to address that, Joe? 
Uh, yeah, so that's one of the reasons why we want to be able to go indoors because um, in our neighborhood, there would just be too much road business, road activity, car activity um, spewing into the food. So um, this is one of the, another good reason to figure out good ways of um, growing in enclosed environmentally controlled spaces. Um, I think, you know, where, where Michelle is, she's more like near a ravine and like better outdoor space that is uh, a lot cleaner than where we are. So um, some parts of the city, it's fine. And many parts of the city, it's not. And uh, it's really important that we have climate, um, clean water and clean air to grow our food in as well as um, near the city and outside the city. So yeah, it's a very big issue in my mind as well. And I'd like to add that uh, rooftop growing is uh, another area for, for development that um, mm -hmm. gets it away from the road, away from the squirrels. Ha ah. yeah. ha And, um, you know, it, there's actually a lot of potential on rooftops. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely something that, uh, that people should be, um, aware of and thinking about. Go ahead, Lily. Oh, sorry. Urbanization yes. also affects um, uh, land as well. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the soil that is excavated in uh, in the cities, you know, when developers um, excavate in order to build condos or underground parking lots, or you know, even just to to remove the topsoil so that they can, you know, put in and um, whatever. All that uh, is taken to the countryside and farmers are paid to take that. Um, and because farm farming doesn't provide a decent livelihood for the most part, a lot of farmers take that. Um, they, they take that money, they accept that um, all, all of that polluted overburden, you know, or, um, or urban soil, and then they put it on their fields. And so all of the urban pollutants that accumulate, you know, are then spread over onto farmers' fields and go into the crops that we then send out <laughs> for people to eat. And it's not common knowledge, but uh, yeah, urban pollution does not stay in the cities. Ooh. I should mention that the um, organic green bin waste, um, a lot of it is not suitable for putting back into the soil, it's often very contaminated. And there's a huge stinking pile of it near Arthur, Ontario, and another huge stinking football field worth of it um, just like north of the city. And it's just disgusting. It's so uh, volatile that, you know, the, the workers aren't allowed to smoke anywhere near it. And um, it's a big source of methane gas. It's a disaster. We really need to smarten up and get way better at this. Thank you for pointing out some of the ways we need to improve. And I know there was um, a point in there earlier about the UN and the corporate control of food. I think that was a question to find out maybe a bit more about what we can do. Um, you know, what, what do we need to raise with our government or how do we raise things with our government so that we are not uh, contributing to more corporate control, but we are supporting, uh, you know, the kind of work that Sally's doing to get farmers started that you're doing, Lily. Uh, and and that the, that all of you are doing um, to bring agriculture closer to people. Um, what how, how can people help? Huh. Well, we need a lot of advocacy. We need people to really push. You know, like let's not just pretend that the government's the enemy off in the corner somewhere. Like honestly, oftentimes it's government regulations that are standing in the way. This provincial government has done absolutely nothing and we need a new one as soon as possible. Um, we're starting to see some movement at the federal level, but we really need to push them harder, much harder. They're starting to think about things like using agriculture to draw down carbon, but we need to push them to do more. And then with cities, you know, cities could be doing a lot more to bring healthy, affordable food into the city to help aggregate the purchasing power. Like we could be working with hospitals and various other um, places in order to aggregate our purchasing power and support farmers to have decent livelihoods to grow real healthy food for us. But it's going to require governments as well as business, as well as individuals to all work together. And we need a lot of advocacy to make these changes happen. Donations don't hurt either. <laughs> I think if I could add, I also, I also think it's 
uh, going back to what I said at the beginning, I think it's very, really, really important to to challenge where we're putting the what we're investing in with the Ministry of Agriculture and, and what what sort of um, I mean, even though I know that there are new programs to make sure people use cover crops and things, like there's so much more to do and it's extremely urgent. So one of the things that's happening is is that the government, um, federal government has has started to attend to the idea of social finance, which is what we do, right? So social and environmental impacts in investing. But we need to make sure that doesn't get co-opted and that it stays with the kind of change that we're all talking about. And so could I just say that we're in, we have to wrap up soon, but we are um, expecting to have a federal election called very soon. If there's a question for MPs, you know that it would be helpful for people to ask that links agriculture and climate, um, you know, put it in the chat, you can send it out to people. Um, and then we will be having a provincial election next June. So if there are things that we need to do to raise the agriculture and climate during the provincial election, um, we'll do that uh, as well. I know that Drawdown um, and Climate Fast will um, continue the education that's coming from the series going forward. But if you've got a question to suggest for the federal election now, let's put it in the chat. Um, what would you ask uh, a member of parliament to do? I don't know if National, National Farmers Union has something, Lily, that you could suggest. And I think we have to wrap up in a couple of minutes. So I'm just gonna- I will say um, our open letter uh, lays out a lot of the issues and has some pretty strong concrete demands. So if people wanna go to EcoJust Food Network and find that open letter and sign on to it, we will be releasing it later this month. And we will be asking for the St. Patrick's Market down on Queen Street to be turned over to the Black Indigenous Food Sovereignty and to become part of our local healthy food infrastructure. And these kinds of concrete specific steps, the more of them we can take and the more specific requests and demands we can make, the better. But supporting farmers and making sure farmers have a decent livelihood is absolutely critical. It's to me, the bottom line of all of this. Farmers should not be living in debt for the privilege of feeding us. They should have a decent livelihood because we can't live without them. So I would say making sure farmers have you know, guaranteed income or whatever it is to help stabilize farmers so that they can change and shift and innovate in their farming practices would be a first and foremost step that needs to be taken. And keeping land, protecting land, first and foremost, no new highways, no more urban sprawl, going all over farmland like let's protect our farmland you know i mean read sally's book she's got some incredible facts and information and things that people all need to know and like if we don't protect our farmland what are we doing we're going to be one of the last habitable zones on earth in about 30 years we're collecting already humanity from all over the planet it's incumbent on us if humanity is going to have a future that we protect our farmland and make sure everybody has decent food i'd like yes. to um <laughs> I'd like to know one thing that is maybe not quite uh, is kind of sort of at a tangent to this um, to this panel, um, but uh, but I want to go back to the initial video that we watched um, about Imagine in the future. And uh, there was a comment um, that the the young woman um, made about, you know, uh, regenerative agriculture protecting um, and uh, indig indigenous rights. Um, there is a link there, but I don't think that it's an automatic uh, given that, you know, if we implement regenerative agriculture, that the indigenous peoples will be uh, respected or, um, or will even get, you know, um, their territory and their sovereignty back. That is not, you know, um, a, an a priori, uh, and we should not assume that regenerative agriculture automatically equates into indigenous sovereignty. You know, I can totally see a, a, a settler Canada, you know, implement regenerative agriculture on its own terms on the backs of Indigenous peoples. Um, and, you know, when we think about the what's happening, you know, in Northern Ontario with people um, looking for land further and further north, not only because it's 
cheaper, but also because, um, you know, uh, it's more climate friendly as, as the earth warms, you know, we are in, we are encroaching on some of the uh, um, last uh, remote communities, indigenous communities, you know, that because of their remoteness have been able to uh, um, withstand some of the, uh, I guess, I don't know, but, but have been able to at least, you know, um, do uh, govern themselves to some extent on their own terms. But as Canadians go more and more north looking for land, you know, with the best of intentions, you know, we are uh, taking that land. Um, and so I, I, I just want to put that bug into people's minds and not to have a rosy picture that, oh, if we can just have regenerative agriculture, all the other ills of society will be fixed. No, we need to make sure that regenerative agriculture, indigenous sovereignty, you know, um, justice and equity are pursued at the same time and with the same fervor. Okay, thank you very much. I, I'm going, I think we have to draw this to a close. So um, I would really like to thank everyone, uh, all our speakers uh, for coming. I would like to thank our audience for coming and for participating in our chat um, and taking such an interest in this topic because it's not talked about often enough. I believe we have a slide with other thank, thanks to be shown. Do we have a slide? Um, Yes, I have a slide. Just give me one second. Okay. Um, we want to thank um, the, uh, the organizations that did the planning. Like, it's really individuals, and you're looking at, at several of them right here who've done the planning of our series. Um, and that is, uh, uh, yes. So we had our MC tonight, David and myself, um, our speakers, Sally, Sandy, Michelle, Lily, and Josephine. And our production crew, Eileen, Mark, Sharon, Priscilla, Ray, and Betty. Um, Betty also does our graphics, so our promotion that was aided by her. And also by Fatma, who's not on the list here, but helped with the promo. Um, and she's a member of Climate Fast in training with us. So um, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to put this event on for you. And um, we will do a follow-up email to those of you who registered on Eventbrite because I've got your email list and I can give you the links that we were shared tonight. Um, yes, so a ray of hope in the midst of very bad news today. Yes, that's one way to describe our event tonight, Lily is saying. And, um, you know, the future is going to be determined by those of us who take action now to create that future. And our children, you know, and those who are young now need us to take the steps necessary to make the future be one that we choose. Something that Christiana Figueres talks about in her book, The Future We Choose. Um, we can make it that difference. And everyone who's turned out tonight, both to speak and to participate um, in the event is, uh, is contributing. And we all welcome new volunteers. So please uh, get in touch if you'd like to work on future events. Uh, if you'd like to work on the election, we've got an election planning team going from Climate Fest and uh, we'd love you to, to join in if you would like. Uh, so I think one more big thank you for everybody. Maybe we can, um, can we unmute everybody and let people sort of uh, wave their hands and say goodbye? I, th I think there's one thing, Lynn, I think there's a survey that should be coming. Awesome. Thank you very much. Where is the survey link? Survey okay. links in the chat. We would love you to fill that survey in. It'll just take a minute. Uh, so click on that and uh, fill that survey in to give us feedback on the event tonight and ideas for the future. That uh, would be. So. Um, and I'd just like to add my thank you to everybody. I, I, I'm really energized by the incredible breadth of knowledge, wisdom, and, and resources that I think we can all share uh, for our own work. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. I'd love to Here's talk to you, Michelle. Take care, guys. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you very you much. So much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.